nonprofit organization that's located just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. We provide professional development and graduate credit courses, workshops, study tours, resources, um, summer institutes for teachers. So year-round, we're offering professional development courses through face-to-face -face programs, online programs, webinars like this. Um, and through our website, you can find lots of resources. Um, we're helping teachers prepare students to thrive in a global economy um, and helping them to instill a flexible global mindset. Um, many of our courses and workshops support globally-minded classrooms um, with an emphasis on themes that encompass multiple world regions. Um, we're thrilled to have Laura with us today. Um, she is um, truly a global author. Um, her books come from all over the world, um, and she will tell you a little bit about her background. Before we get started, I do want to say a special thanks to um, some of our sponsors, Springshare um, and Vocabulary.com, who were who helped us get the teacher toolkit um, online and promote. Um, that resource and this webinar to all of you. Um, and now to introduce Laura. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she is truly a global author. Um, her background um, has given her the chance to travel to many countries, um, and her books are set in Ecuador, Mexico, France. Um, the Queen of Water is her most recent book, but she also she has six previous young adult novels um, before that, um, and I've listed them here. The Indigo Notebook, The Ruby Notebook, The Jade Notebook, What the Moon Saw, Red Glass, and Star in the Forest. Um, the Queen of Water, um, many of us, hopefully we've all read it. If you haven't read it, um, hopefully you will after you hear about it today. Um, it has won a number of awards, um, so many that I cannot even fit them all onto this PowerPoint slide. Um, but it was selected as an Oprah's 2012 Kids Reading List. I think we picked it before Oprah, so yay, we're a little bit ahead of Oprah, but that's exciting. Um, it was an America's Award Honorable Mention, um, a School Library Journal Best Book of 2011, a Junior Library Guild Selection, an Amelia Bloomer Project Recommended Book, um, many awards from American Library Association groups, as well as other um, international book um, award groups. Um, so. Laura, if you're ready, I'm going to unmute you. And Laura is going to give us a little bit okay. of background um, on her and um, how she became an author. And then we will get to the Q&A. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Hope so. Um, well, first off, thank you so much for being here. This is such a huge honor for me to be talking to so many people from all over the country. Um, and I'm also really grateful to Primary Source for doing such an amazing job organizing this, and especially to Jennifer, who has, I know she's put a ton of work into this, so thank you. Um, so I, was, I thought I'd first spend a few minutes talking about how I ended up becoming an author. Um, I always loved reading, um, ever since the time I was a, a small child, and I love trying to write my own stories. And I have stories from when I was in elementary school that I wrote that are just kind of fun little illustrated books, some are choose your own adventure. And I just felt such a thrill writing these books. It, it, was, it was magical for me to create stories and share them with people. So I kept writing throughout elementary school and middle school. And, and then as a teenager, I started becoming a little more shy with my writing. And I didn't want to share it with people. I was afraid of criticism. So I became kind of secretive about my writing as a teenager and young adult. And I would actually lock it in this uh, wooden box and I had a special key for the box that I would wear around my neck and I thought if anybody looked inside that box and saw the writing that I was working on that I would just absolutely die. Um, so I was really, really insecure about my writing for many years and what changed that for me is uh, after college I had majored in cultural anthropology so you know, studying how people live around the world in different cultures and after I, um, after I graduated from college, I decided that I wanted to go have some adventures and learn about different cultures. And um, I ended up getting a job at a university in Oaxaca, Mexico, which is in an indigenous Mixtec region of Oaxaca. And I really, really loved it there. And I spent a lot of time um, interviewing people, listening to their stories, having my own adventures. And I wrote everything down in these spiral-bound notebooks. So I was filling up notebook after notebook 
uh, about all these adventures I was having, the stories I was hearing. And I thought, you know, I don't feel like locking this up in a box. I feel like sharing it with people because these are pretty interesting experiences and, and I don't want to keep them to myself. So that, that um, living in Oaxaca for two years really made me feel braver about sharing my, my stories and writing with other people. So I started doing that in my early 20s and I started getting good feedback from my friends and my family members about my writing. And, and little by little I grew braver and braver. I joined a writing group. I, I took a few creative writing classes and you know, eventually got the confidence to start sending um, my first book out to um, agents and editors. And, and so my first book was What the Moon Saw that was published in 2006. And um, it, it was scary for me to share that book with the world, um, but at the same time, it, it, it's been an amazing experience to hear readers give me feedback about how my books have touched them in some way or how they've connected with my books in some way. Um, so, so that's kind of my background of, of how I became a writer. And now I just wanted to talk a little bit more about The Queen of Water, just maybe for five minutes, and then, and I'm, then I'll listen to your questions. I'm really excited to hear what you guys um, have to say and ask. So you see the picture here of me and Maria. We met in 2004. I was teaching English at a community college and she was a student there. So we hit it off and uh, became friends and um, decided to embark on this project together. So Jennifer, can we go to the next slide now? So this is um, the the landscape of her of her early childhood. This is outside of Otavalo, Ecuador, um, and in you know in the Andes, and it's a it's a pretty stunning landscape. I went I did two research trips to Ecuador to um, learn more about the people and places in her story, and, and so these are mostly pictures that I took on those research trips. So can we go to the next one now, Jennifer? So this is the house where Maria Virginia spent her first few years of her life um, up until she went away with uh, Dr. Rita. She, um, you know, it's pretty much, I took this picture, but it's pretty similar to um, how it looked when she was a, a small child. It's a one-room house. And the next picture, I think, is the interior view. Uh, well, this is her parents. <laughs> yeah, this is good. This, these are her parents, and, and so I was able to meet her parents, and, and they don't speak much Spanish, but um, it was a really interesting experience for me to, to meet them. And um, I mentioned the guinea pigs in the corner of the room. I think they appear in the first paragraph of the book, and, and that, was, that took a little getting used to for me, is seeing some guinea pigs in the corner of the house. Okay. Um, this is the town where when Maria Virginia moved um, away from her family's village, she moved in with a doctorita and, um, and her family. This is the, the house um, where she ended up living with them for several years. And then this is the middle school. So the doctorita and her husband were teachers at this, at this middle school and um, this is where Maria was, you know, she was sneaking into the science laboratory to do experiments and, um, and where she was looking longingly at the students who were, who were able to attend school. Um, so there's a scene in, in the book where um, Maria is in a school, I call, I'll just say real quick, I call her Maria, Maria, um, but in the book she's referred to as Virginia or Virginia. Um, and her family, a lot of family and friends in Ecuador call her Virginia, but I, I don't know, her American friends, for whatever reason, we just call her Maria, so don't want you to feel confused about that. But um, this is the school play that she was in, where she, that she wrote and starred in and directed. And here she's like kind of in agony, kind of biting her hair and crying and, you know, kind of channeling all of this tumultuous emotion into her performance. And there's also a scene in the book where she um, gives, after the play, she gives her mom a Mother's Day card. And um, it's a very kind of uncomfortable moment for her. She feels a really big rift between her and her um, indigenous mother. And so I, I just thought it was really neat that we actually, you know, I actually could find a photograph of, of um, that interaction. Um, I got these photographs from the school play and, um, and this one of her and her mom 
uh, when I visited, the, I actually visited the school in Maria's village, and she has local fame there. They had this whole scrapbook of photos about Maria Virginia, and it was just really neat to see how even after all these years, they still um, really valued her and really felt like she was a special person. This is the hotel um, where she worked. It's called the Hotel Otavalo. And um, I visited there. I stayed there for a night. I, I got to know some of the workers. One of the workers there um, was, was there when she was working there as well. So um, there, she actually won, you know, she won the Queen of Water honor, but then she also won a whole bunch of other similar kinds of um, queen competitions after the book ends. So these are photos from some of them. And um, this is a, a French photographer took this picture of her for a magazine. So this is when she was a teenager after she kind of reconnected with her indigenous identity. And I, I um, found a newspaper article that she had saved, and I just kind of uh, focused in on one of these question, questions to share with you. But so this was after she was winning the Queen competitions, and the interviewer, you know, she's a teenager, the interviewer asked her, well, tell us about your family. And she responded, um, that's a story that one day I would like to make a book out of. That's my big dream. It's a dream of overcoming obstacles, overcoming my own obstacles and something that any girl my age could do if she only has the courage to know how to make her dream a reality. And when I found that newspaper article, I kind of got shivers up my spine that, you know, thinking about how her dream had become a reality and she ha we had written this book and, and it was really an honor for me to be part of her realizing this dream. And um, so this is a picture of me and Maria in Ecuador and we're with our friend Alex who um, also was a student at the community college where I taught. She's from Ecuador, and she's Mestiza. And um, it was interesting, Maria and Alex were able to form a friendship here in the United States that would have been more difficult to form in Ecuador because of the, you know, the ethnic divisions in the society. But um, when I go to Ecuador, I am able to um, see, spend time with both Alex's family and kind of to see the Mestiza side of things, and then also with Maria Virginia and her family. And finally, we don't have any pictures of her as a young child, but um, this is a picture I took of a little girl um, in, in uh, a village near Maria Virginia's, and uh, I just thought you might be curious to see what maybe she looks like um, as a young girl. So I think this might be it. Is this the last picture, Jennifer? Yes, this is the last slide. Um, is there anything else you want to tell us before we start the Q and A? Um, well, uh, just basically that the the experience. This is probably it's hard to say which book is my favorite of mine, but this was an extremely special book for me. It really was a life changing experience and a really rare and special experience to be able to collaborate so closely with somebody on on a memoir kind of project and um, Maria and I became very, very close throughout this this whole process and kind of consider each other sisters and and um, yeah, so I guess just to say that this had a really profound effect on me as a as a human being doing this project with her. So that's it. So I can take questions now. All right. Thank you, Laura. Um, I do have some questions already. Um, our first question is, what happened to Antonio? At the end of the book, it says that Maria Virginia was with her kid in the shop when Laura met her. Um, does that mean she found Antonio later on and got married, or did she find someone else? Right. So she did not get married to Antonio. She's actually now married to a really great guy named Tino, who is, um, he's an amazing musician. He plays, he's indigenous, Otavaleño also, um, and, and he, um, plays like kind of Andean pan flute type music, um, really, really beautiful. And so he actually travels internationally playing music. Um, so Antonio, uh, Maria still has very, very tender kind of memories and feelings toward Antonio. She, she gets, I don't know, kind of like a sweet, wistful look on her face when she talks about him. Um, 
he actually did come to, he found out that she was working at the hotel and living at the hotel. This was like a year or two after she left, um, she left that village, that town. And he came looking for her. And by that time, Maria was already having a lot of success in school and she'd already kind of created her own little community with her, with the workers at the hotel and her classmates. And, and she was just really feeling you know, starting to feel really happy with her, her identity. And she realized that being with Antonio would really mean going back to kind of living the life of a farmer's wife or, you know, a farming family. And although she had really tender feelings for him still and, and a lot of appreciation for what he did for her, uh, she didn't, that's not the life she envisioned for herself. So, you know, she kind of sadly told him farewell and that she wasn't interested. Um, but it was it was hard for her to do that because she really did appreciate him. Um, and another question. This one is from Sherilyn and Heidi. They have a similar question. Um, what inspired you to write about Virginia or Maria Virginia? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as I was, so I have a master's degree in anthropology. So after I lived in Oaxaca. For two years, I went to University of Arizona um, and, and started working toward my master's degree. I did field work, um, working with indigenous women and their issues in Oaxaca. And I was, so I was hearing many, many, many stories from indigenous women about their lives. And many of them had been servants for mestizo families. And so this is in Oaxaca. This is in a totally, you know, Mexico, a totally different country. But I heard a lot of stories like this. And, I also heard a lot of stories about how, you know, kids and um, indigenous children, even just even just a couple decades ago, would get punished physically by teachers if they even spoke their indigenous language. So I, I heard a lot of these kind of, these stories. Um, always kind of thought in the back of my mind, oh, I would love to work on a life story, an actual you know an actual memoir, a life story of an indigenous woman. And I never quite got that opportunity. I never kind of, I don't know, I, I, in Oaxaca, um, although I did end up in, incorporating many indigenous women's stories into my books, like What the Moon Saw, the grandmothers, if you've read that book, the grandmother's stories are very closely based on real indigenous women's stories in Oaxaca and in my book Red Glass too. So I kind of was able to do that to some extent, but I wanted to do a collaborative project. I wanted to really feel like you know, I was coming at it with, as equals with, uh, with an indigenous woman, and I wanted the, the story in her words and her voice, and, and I wanted it to be messages that she cared about. And so I kind of always had my antenna up for this kind of opportunity. And then, you know, I, I hadn't ever been to Ecuador before, but when I met Maria Virginia and I heard her story and, and how amazing it was, and she's so eloquent and so intelligent, and um, and then and then on top of it, she actually had always dreamed of having of of having a, a book about her about her childhood. Um, it just seemed like the perfect opportunity, and um, so it was really for me too. It was the realization of a dream I had to do a collaborative project with an indigenous woman, because um, although Maria's story, you know, she she has a there's a unique spin for sure. She's really spunky and, and a really unique person. But her story is really representative of what lots of indigenous women have gone through um, over the past century. And Mary asks, how did you feel while you were writing this book? Well, it, it was interesting. It was very emotional. Um, we spent probably over a year doing these um, kind of interviews. She would come over, and at that time her son was about, he was a little toddler, and you know, he would play, and we would be talk. Sorry, we would be talking about her life. I tape recorded it, and um, and and you know, in some parts of her story, I mentioned this in the author's note, but some parts of her story we had to actually act out so I could completely envision it. And I had to really probe deeper and deeper. And and you know, if if she kind of skimmed over one part of her life, I had to kind of dig deeper and and have her explain more and have her explain feeling, you know, layers, layer after layer of feelings that she had. And, you know, she did um, experience um, 
uh, horrible abuse from her own parents and then also from the mestizo couple. And it was really painful at times to, to talk about this and also me being in a position where I had to ask her more and more detailed questions about it so that we could really make those scenes feel vivid and authentic. Um, so, you know, there were, it was very, very emotional for us um, at times, but it was also, I mean, there were real, also moments of a lot of giggling and, you know, just all the ridiculous things that happened that were inspired by MacGyver, like the booby traps and all of that stuff. It was very, I had a lot of fun and there's a lot of laughter there. So, um, this, this, I would say that the experience of writing this book was more emotional than any, any other book that I've written, for sure. Um, and Laura, we had another question about how this, um, how writing this book changed your life. You, you address, mm -hmm. you did address that, but are there any, mm -hmm. is there just like one profound piece that has changed your life? Mm -hmm. I, I guess I think, you know, I feel that books in general, one thing I love about books is that you, they allow you to empathize with a person who might, whose life might seem very different from yours on the surface. Um, so, you know, my life has been on the surface very different from Maria Virginia's. It, you know, we have different, you know, I come from a much more privileged background and my a more educated family and, you know, different ethnicity. And, and so on one hand, there are many things that are very different um, about our lives and our experiences. And, and I, I think it's amazing. It's been an amazing experience to be able to um, really kind of slip in as much as humanly possible, kind of slip into her heart and her mind and her memories and um, and just experience the world as she experienced it as a child. It just seems like an, kind of an extreme opportunity for, for really empathizing with another person's experience. And especially if that person is, is so different on the surface from, from how you are. And, and you know, it, it, I felt like it was a really rare opportunity to um, understand another human's experiences in such, in such a profound way. I mean, we did hundreds of hours of interviews and storytelling, and sometimes Maria jokes that I know her memories better than she does. Um, so I, I just, I think that's something that you don't encounter in life in general, um, that, that type of intimacy. And, and I, I feel really, really grateful that I had that opportunity. Um, and we have a question from two students, Roxana and Jerry Lee. Was it hard believing the story of Virginia um, and how such a thing could happen to someone? Yeah, it was, um, I guess what, what for me, the, um, I mean, I had heard stories before of pretty awful things happening to, you know, vulnerable indigent people who came from vulnerable circumstances like Maria Virginia's, you know, when I lived in Oaxaca and saw the poverty there and, you know, there was, in many of the communities I visited there, there was a lot of domestic violence and alcoholism, too. So I had heard, you know, stories about bad things happening. I think with Maria Virginia's story, what struck me was how creative and resourceful she was and able to rise above her circumstances. And it seemed like she just kind of seemed like a superhero to me at times where she could just, you know, jump over any obstacle. Um, and, and I just... The, the, the parts that I had trouble believing at times were just how full of spunk and energy she was and how she was really truly able to, um, first of all, envision these dreams and think outside the box and envision what she wanted her life to look like. And then she actually was smart enough and um, spunky enough to make those dreams a reality. I, I, I found that extraordinary. And that was a neat thing about going and visiting. Um, you know, all these places and um, these, these people in Ecuador who, who have known Maria um, at different parts in her life, and they all kind of affirmed this, that, that she's an extraordinary person and um, that, that there's something really special about her. I heard that at the hotel when I visited the hotel. I heard that from, um, uh, from teachers at, at the school where she, the elementary school in her town. So, um, it, it was it was interesting to not only hear the story from Maria herself, but then hear it from from other people um, in her life. And 
we have so many questions. I'm trying to get through them. Um, <laughs> here, we have a question from Kevin. Does Virginia still speak Quechua? Quechua? Yeah, she does speak Quechua. Um, she actually visits her parents. She and her parents have a pretty good relationship now. Um, and, uh, you know, she has been able to fully forgive them for, for all of the you know, horrible things that happened in her early childhood. Um, but actually, they're a big part of her life now. She, she takes her son pretty regularly to visit her parents in their village um, where they speak Quechua. Um, her husband's family also is Quechua speaking, and they visit them quite often in their village. So um, it, it is, yes, speaking Quechua and spending time in indigenous, uh, rural indigenous communities is still, is still part of her life. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to visit her because, you know, she doesn't wear her, her indigenous clothing all the time. When she goes and visits family, she always wears it. Um, or if we go to the market, she wears it. Um, but you know, other times, she basically other times if we're hanging out around the house, or if we're just going to the internet cafe or something, um, then she might not wear the clothes. So she she feels really comfortable enough with her identity that she she basically can um, she can feel comfortable with indigenous people speaking Quechua and and dressing in her native clothing, but then she also feels completely at ease, you know, in a more on the mestizo kind of side of things. And, um, and it's, you know, I think it's pretty, it's, I think she feels pretty empowered as far as being able to, to kind of choose what her identity is. We also have several questions about um, Maria's relationship with the Dr. Rita and mm -hmm. the little boys. Um, Lillian and Linda and Kevin all have asked, um, has she kept in contact with the Dr. Rita and her family um, and with uh, the boys, Andresito and, um, I'm drawing a blank on his name, um, but uh -huh. with the little boys that she babysat? Right, yeah, and she has actually kept in touch with them, and, you know, particularly, mainly because of the boys, um, and so she, she sees them, she sees the family several times a year now, um, she wouldn't consider herself close with them, but she, you know, she kind of knows what's going on in their lives, um, and the, they, the boys actually call her sister. Um, so they, there's real love there uh, with the boys. Um, as far as the Dr. Rita and her husband, there has been, there has been tension in that relationship. Um, at one point later, you know, after the story ends. At one point, Maria did tell the doctorita, you know, look, your husband um, sexually harassed me, and and um, and that and that was one of the main reasons why I ended up fleeing. And the doctorita didn't believe her. Um, but then later, so in the conversation, she didn't believe her. But then later, after the doctorita thought about it a little more, the doctorita said, well, actually, that is kind of makes sense because they had subsequently had other indigenous girl maids, and. She, the Dr. Rita had sensed some, some things going on between her husband and those other girls. And so, you know, although at first the Dr. Rita denied it, you know, on some level she kind of had a sense of what was going on. Um, so, you know, but Maria feels in general that they're pretty negative people. She just kind of feels negative energy around them and she feels like it's not it's it's just not a good use of her time to spend time with them, um, but I think you know again the boys are the main reason why she really has any contact with them. And a follow up question to that um, from Sarah, Abby, and Opal: Have the Dr. Rita and Carlos read the book? Um, and do they haven't? Okay. Yeah, they haven't. It's only in English at this point, and we're we're really trying to get it published in Spanish. But unfortunately, foreign rights in Spanish were not bought. So, um, yeah, we're working on that now. But no, the answer is no. They haven't. I mean, they know that the book exists, but they they don't really, you know, know too much about it because they haven't been able to read it. And Elise wanted to know: Have you met the Dr. Rita and her family? I actually did meet the Dr. Rita, and um, it, it was a really interesting experience. I met her in um, on my first visit there, 
And I, I wasn't mentally prepared to meet her because I really, like in my mind, I, re I really had a very vivid image of her and I really disliked her. And, um, but, so I was visiting Ecuador and Maria at that time was in the United States. So I stayed with Maria's husband and son and some other relatives. And at one point he said, oh, do you want to go see the Dr. Rita's house? And I said, sure, because I thought, you know, he was taking me to all these different places that were important places in Maria's life. And I said, sure. And I kind of thought that we would just look at the house and that I just would be able to, like, take pictures and take notes and everything at the, on the actual house. And, um, and then we were sitting there, and I was taking notes and pictures, and then the Dr. Rita came out. And uh, we were just kind of sitting there in the car. And so then we went inside her house for 15 minutes and I was just very unprepared for the whole thing. I, I didn't really know what to say. I didn't, I wasn't exactly sure what Maria had told her about the book. So I just kind of mostly kept my mouth shut. Um, it was a very, very, very awkward <laughs> um, interaction because Maria's husband does not like this woman at all. Um, and I think it was it was extremely uncomfortable at the moment, but I think it was useful for me because I got a sense of what she looks like physically, and I got a sense too of her personality, her kind of her sense of humor, and it, it 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 kind of was the missing piece I think to really make that that character come alive for me. So although it was painful for me at the time, <laughs> at, at it, you know in retrospect it was useful for for making that character three-dimensional for readers. Um, and we have a couple of questions about um, Maria's life after the Queen of Water. Claire wanted to know um, how her life changed. Um, the novel stops just after she's become the Queen of Water. Um, how did this impact her in the later years? Yeah. So she, um, so as I mentioned, she ended up winning a number of other competitions kind of similar to that the Queen of Water competition and so she kind of acquired kind of a some local fame in the town of Otavalo. Um, she, people would start recognizing her in the streets and she was invited to have her own radio show and her radio show was largely about kind of like the power of positive thinking kind of kind of stuff and reaching your dreams. Um, and then she also acted in this television movie in Ecuador, um, and uh, she, you know, so she was, she kind of was able to get a kind of a public role in in her in her town on a pretty local level. Um, she, you know, she continued working at the hotel for quite a while, but she she has a pretty entrepreneurial spirit. So, um, you know, she had a she had a a few other things here and there that, that she dipped into and then she began um, doing this uh, Andean craft kind of business where she started coming to the United States and selling like scarves and sweaters and jewelry um, at like festivals and fairs around Colorado and so she started just coming for a couple months every year um, but at the beginning she came for more time and then she then now that she is in college, she um, is is not coming. You know, as she's not able to come for as much time. Um, but so she she did she really got this craft business going and was able to save up money and you know was able to buy a house with her husband and have some you know have a modest degree of you know kind of financial stability. Um, she took some classes at a, at the college after high school. She graduated. At the top of her class, you know, she was class president. She became this track star. She she did all kinds of cool things like activities in school, and then she started college. And then she had her son. A couple years into college, she had her son, and that's when she also started doing her Andean craft business. So she put college on hold, and and then she a few years ago she went back, and she's um, now just two semesters away from. Um, getting a degree in clinical psychology, and so that's kind of her what she what she sees her kind of profession being is um, clinical psychology, and kind of in the meantime she, to pay her way through all of this, she's she continues to come um, on her breaks from school. She comes to the United States to sell crafts. So, you know, she's she is 
really an entrepreneurial, kind of thinking outside of the box person still. And um, she, yeah, she's really excited about about um, being a psychologist. I think it's a really great a great fit for for her. I think she can use a lot of her experiences and kind of the trauma she's been through and kind of transform them into kind of fuel for helping other people get through their hard times. Um, so we do have several questions about um, her her life um, with with the Dr. Rita and her family. Um, one question that we have is um, about the mestizo and indigenous populations. How strong is the division between the mestizo and indigenous people today compared to when Maria was growing up? Well, I think that the, the racism is not quite as overt today. Um, indigenous people are not, as mar not quite as marginalized. Um, you know, back then, Maria's parents felt so marginalized, they, didn't, they felt powerless to do really anything to get their daughter back. Um, nowadays, there are there are more walls and policies to make sure that um, indigenous people are not exploited in the way that Maria Virginia was. It still does happen. There still are indigenous girl servants, but it's not as rampant as it was um, when Maria was was young. And you know the the, the president now is very pro indigenous. He actually. He's not indigenous himself. Um, uh, this is Correa. This is is his name. But although he's not indigenous himself, he did like teach school in an indigenous area for a while. So he speaks Quechua, and he's really about um, promoting education and reducing poverty among indigenous people. Um, so there. Another interesting thing is that um, many people, like Maria and her husband, indigenous people have been traveling the world selling Andean crafts and also playing Andean music. So they've actually reached um, some financial, many indigenous people have um, attained um, some financial success through, through traveling. And um, so, you know, with their economic success comes more kind of respect and more voice in their society. Um, as far as the relationship between mestizos and indigenous people, unfortunately, there's still a pretty big barrier. And this is where it was interesting for me to spend time with my mestizo friend, Alex, with her family and kind of doing new things in mestizo society and, and then spending time with Maria and, and her, and her um, family. And you know, my friend Alex told me, and Alex is a pretty open-minded person, but at one point Alex, and so Alex moved to the United States, married an American guy, and she was taking English classes here in Colorado. And at one point she said to me, you know, Laura, my friend, if I told my friends, my mestizo friends back in Ecuador, that I hang out with Maria here, like Maria Virginia, or that I hang out with an indigenous woman in um, Colorado, and that she's one of my close friends in Colorado, my, she said, my mestizo friends would not believe it. Like they would, they would say, Alex, what could we possibly have in common with an indigenous woman? What do you guys talk about? What do you guys do? And so she felt that socially, there's still a very big division as far as indigenous people hanging out with indigenous people and mestizos, mestizos hanging out with mestizos. And then, you know, they also told me some other, uh, her family gave me some other examples of kind of latent racism, like, you know, actually in their, in the social club, the pool club they belong to, um, there's a rule that no servants are allowed in the pool. And um, they said that really what it's about is they don't want indigenous people in the pool because they think that they're dirty and don't have good hygiene and everything. So, you know, there's, the, the racism takes less overt forms, but there, there still are those divisions. And Heidi has some students who wanted to know if this book and Maria's story are being used in any way to help the plight of indigenous people. Well, we would we hope so. I donate a portion of my royalties to indigenous group, indigenous rights groups, and um, we would like. I, I think what real what would really be helpful is if we could get this story out in Spanish or if they made a movie out of it. And those things, unfortunately, are somewhat beyond our control at this point. 
Um, but we have had a lot of uh, emails from reader, you know, from readers who speak English but have Latin American heritage and have family in different parts of Latin America. And many of them have written to us and said, you know, I, I'd like to share this with my mother in Ecuador or my sister in Ecuador. And, um, and, and so I think that what I'm hearing them say is that, that many people aren't really even aware of the racism that still exists. And many, especially many Mestizo people in Ecuador and in other parts of Latin America ha have never really taken the time to try and really deeply empathize with what indigenous girls and women have had to go through. And, you know, the neat thing about stories and books is that, you know, you slip into this other person's life <laughs> for the days or weeks that you're reading the book and you have a really deep kind of empathy and, and, and compassion that develops for, for that person. And so, I, you know, I've seen that reaction among people with Latin American heritage in the United States and it kind of gives them a different perspective on like, oh, you know, we had an indigenous girl servant when I was growing up in, in wherever, Colombia or Peru or Ecuador. And, and it kind of makes them think about that experience um, from a different perspective. And um, so, you know, we're, we're hoping that maybe some of those discussions will happen in, in the, within the families of, of people who have read the book, at least in English. And if we can one day get it translated to Spanish, um, then I think it could, could really um, bring bring that indigenous perspective to many, many more people. And another question that we have um, from Susan is that um, one of the powerful aspects of this book for her was the insight it provided into that coerced, unfree labor. Um, and she was wondering if you were thinking about parallels between 19th century slave narratives as you wrote Maria's story. Um, and, you know, she said she would definitely pair it with slave narratives um, if she mm -hmm. were teaching this book. But did you think about that as you were writing? That's a great question. I think, you know, as I was writing this, I, I, not specifically slave narratives, but, um, you know, I definitely thought of all my coursework in um, for my master's degree in cultural anthropology and reading reading narratives of different people who have been oppressed and have found creative ways to resist, um, you know, in all different cultures. Um, and so I really, you know, one thing we, we really focused on in my anthropology classes was, you know, not just looking at how people were oppressed, but looking at creative ways that they resisted their oppressors. And, you know, I just felt like Maria's story was full of this kind of stuff. Like, you know, I get like setting booby traps and staging that burglary and studying in secret and doing science experiments in secret. I felt like I, I saw all of those acts as acts of resistance um, against against her oppressors. And I guess so in that in that sense, I had you know that type of narrative in mind. But um, I love when I hear teachers saying what they would pair um, this book with, and, and I think that it is a fantastic idea. Um, one, one comment I've had a lot of people make is um, the book The Help, um, which has, you know, The Help, there, there are some, certainly some similarities with Maggie Virginia's story as far as she was pretty much, in, she was being exploited by these people, by this family, but at the same time she really wanted them to love her and she really had some, she had some closeness and she felt needed and she felt appreciated in certain ways although in other ways she felt exploited. So I think that kind of ambivalence um, that, that she felt is something that people saw in the help as well. So, um, yeah. And Laura, we have some questions about your writing routine. Um, some students in Maine ask, um, do you have any advice for young writers? Okay, advice for young writers. Well, I think, I guess my first, piece of advice would be to read a lot of books because um, I definitely felt like that was the first step for me is just reading a lot um, and noticing in books like when authors do something really well or if a story just seems amazing to you ask yourself well what did the author do that made this book so amazing so just be conscious of <clears throat> of that and and try and incorporate it in, in your own writing um, and then I would also say um, just don't don't put too much pressure on yourself to make your writing 
perfect. Um, it, you know, I know I would get frustrated as you, oh, I still do, but especially as a young writer, I had this amazing vision in my head of what the story was going to be like, and and then when I actually was writing it down, it seemed to really fall short of my my vision. Um, but what I really learned is that your your story's not going to come out perfect the first time. And don't be afraid to revise it a few times. I did, with my book, What the Moon Saw, I revised it over 25 times. Um, and I, I do revise all of my books at least, I would say at least about 10 times. I just think that it's not, if you told me that I had to write a book perfectly the first time, I would be too scared to write a single word. But the thing that gets me through is reminding myself that, okay, this is just a first draft. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'll go back and make it better. Um, so yeah, so I think it's important to not be too hard on yourself and have fun with it. Um, I would also keep a journal. I think it's so important to um, get just get used to transforming your thoughts in your head into words on paper. So you know, if if, if you're a young writer, just keep a journal with you and write down ideas, dreams, character studies, plot ideas. You know, what, whatever you feel like, just get used to feeling of, of writing things down. And some students in Hingham ask, what elements of the novel are fictionalized and which are true to life? Well, we try to keep everything very, very, very true to life. Um, in the, when we first started this project, we wanted it to be nonfiction, <laughs> completely nonfiction, 100% true. Um, and I kind of approached it like I did my master's thesis. Um, with just really, really meticulous notes and quotes and everything. Um, and then we started giving the, the manuscript to readers, like people in my writing group and my mom, to get their feedback. And it kind of felt like academic and kind of boring that way. Um, and so Maria, I, you know, Maria and I had a conversation about, well, how, what, what's our audience for this? And what's your, what is our goal with this book? And it was important to her that it be accessible not just to academics, but to teens and to adults who, you know, maybe have not studied anthropology. So, um, and, and then another thing was we wanted it, we both wanted it to be a very engaging story. We wanted it to like really captivate people and we wanted that readers to feel kind of immersed in her world. So we made the decision, I think this was a few years into the project. The book took us over six years to, to write. And about you know, a couple years into it, we decided that in order to accomplish our goals of having a wide audience and, um, and uh, having it be like a really engaging narrative, that we would need to do some slight fictionalizing. And so the parts that basically what that meant was for me was kind of restructuring it. Um, so in, in earlier drafts, I went through like her life chronologically from the time she from her earliest childhood memory, you know, all the way through her teenage years, and it kind of plotted along that way, and it, it just, it seemed too scattered. So we had to choose what themes, you know, we had to choose well, what are the themes and what are the messages, and the main theme was, well, her identity, and her, like, her, her quest for an, for identity, and her, her overcoming these different, finding a way to overcome obstacles. So a lot of it was just about cut, 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 cutting things and omitting certain things in order to kind of shape the narrative, um, which if it were straight nonfiction, I wouldn't have probably felt comfortable, you know, omitting certain big chunks of her life for the sake of the story. Um, there were a few scenes that we got some feedback at one point that we needed some more um, kind of sociocultural context for mestizo and indigenous relations. So I, I included a few scenes toward the end uh, to give readers the sense in a really tangible way. So one of them is where Maria goes to the, she, she's invited to the swimming pool to her friend's birthday party, and then she finds out that, in, that um, servants and indigenous people aren't welcome there. And so that exact situation didn't happen to Maria, however, that is something, when I stayed with my friend Alex and her family, that is currently the policy at their pool club, is no indigenous servants. So I kind of took a real, you know, a, a real element <laughs> of life in Ecuador 
and um, kind of put Maria in that situation, just so readers could could kind of understand how that racism was playing out. Um, so the feelings that Maria felt were, were the same as how she genuinely, you know, how, how she felt in real life, but I felt like I needed a real situa emotional situation that would drive that point home to readers. Um, also, when she overhears the guys in the park telling jokes about Mestizo people, you know, like if, uh, uh, I can't remember the off the top of my head, but there she goes, she's walking through the park and there's a, she overhears a bunch of jokes being told. So that wasn't part, that wasn't something that she told me as part of her life story. However, that is something that is really common in, in Ecuador to tell these kinds of racist jokes. And I felt like readers needed to um, get a sense of, of that. Get, and, and I felt like having a having her overhear these, these guys talking in the park would give readers that kind of um, immediate sense of what that uh, racism felt like to her. So the, the types of scenes that I actually have on my website, like if you go to the Queen of Water page and go to Maria, there's a, there's a link there. I did a blog post where I said exactly which scenes were, were fiction, not fiction. And there's just a few of them here and there. Um, but I really feel like that helped bring the book together and, and raise it to the level where my editor was interested in publishing it. And Laura, we have a question from a student, Danielle. Um, she says she hasn't had a chance to read any of your other books, but was wondering if they're also based on real people. Um, and how is it different writing about a real person versus a completely fictional story? Well, yeah, most of my other books are um, were inspired by real people. Most of the characters were inspire, inspired by um, friends of mine, people I've met. And I feel like with, with those other books, it's more like there's a kind of like, there's a person who's kind of a seed of inspiration. And then I add my imagination, and then the characters kind of grow into their own person. So they're not exactly like the, character, the person who inspired them. Um, and, also, and I feel like my other books are kind of like mosaics, like bits and pieces. Uh, for example, the grandmother in my book, What the Moon Saw, she's kind of a mosaic of various indigenous, uh, older indigenous women healers who I've, who I've been friends with, whose stories I've heard. Um, so I can put a little bit of them into, uh, into her, a little bit of each of them into her, into her character. Um, I think it's a lot easier to write a book that, where you can use your imagination to create characters. It was a lot more time consuming to uh, have to stick to the truth. <laughs> um, you know, because, you know, as a writer, you kind of have a sense of how stories are structured and you kind of have a sense of what the character arc needs to be and what needs to happen where as far as plot. But I really wanted to stay true to Maria's story and her voice and experiences. So it just required lots and lots and lots of discussions and me, you know, calling her, emailing her and saying, hey, what about this? Can you tell me about this? And just a lot more back and forth. Um, it was much, much, much harder to, to write about real life. And it's funny because some people, I think some people who aren't writers think, oh, you know, it, you already have the story. You don't, your imagination doesn't have to do any work. It's all there for you. But that really is not the case. It's so much easier for my imagination to just pull out the stuff it needs. Um, and Laura, we have um, a student named Karen who wanted to, um, she wrote something very lovely, and I wanted to give her the chance to just tell you in person um, instead of it coming through me. So I'm going to unmute um, Catherine now, and she has Karen ready to talk to you. Thank you. OK, Karen, are you there? They are at Harrison High School. Um, Catherine, you're unmuted now. So if you have Karen there, um, she can go ahead and talk to Laura. OK, their audio doesn't seem to be working. I'm sorry. Um, 
I will read what she said. Um, Karen said that she is originally from Peru and connected so much with your story because her uh, grandmother's story was similar to Maria's. And her grandmother was actually named Maria, too. Um, she was from a remote part of Peru and arrived in Lima when she was 12 to work as a maid for a family. Um, and she said she imagines her grandmother getting um, going for a situation similar to Maria's. She said it was very emotional for her. Um, and she wondered if the book would be published in Spanish so that she could give it to her grandmother. Oh, that, that is beautiful. And I, yeah, I feel so moved hearing that letter. And thank you. So this is from Karen? Yes, from thank Karen. You. Thank you, Karen. I, that, that means a lot to me to hear. And, and I just, yeah, it's just amazing to hear how different people's experiences resonate with, with Maria's experience. And I wish, it really does break my heart that we don't have the book available in Spanish. And I, when I hear stories like this, it really motivates me to, to work harder to try and make that happen. Um, but I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to share that with me. I'll t and I'll definitely tell Maria about it too. Um, and Janine has had her hand raised, so I want to give her a chance to ask her question, and then um, we'll have to wrap up in just a minute. So Janine, if you are ready, I'm going to unmute you. Um, and you can ask Laura your question. Hi. Hi. I just, I just more than a question, just wanted to say thank you for um, just the work that you did and how you brought the character to life. I spent time living in South America myself, and it just, it just blessed me that you really brought to life things that I saw also. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we do have many more questions. Um, Laura, would it be possible, would you either respond to them if I send them to you in an email so that we could send them out to people, or do you, would you blog answers to these questions? Sure, I would, I would be very happy to. Um, yeah, I would be happy to. I can um, just go ahead and go through everything the next day or two, and then I can do a, blo a blog post with the answers. Okay, great. So I have all of your questions that didn't get answered um, written down, um, and I will um, send those to, to Laura to answer for you. Um, we, we had so many questions. Thank you all so, so much um, for your participation and the great questions that you asked. Um, I did want to remind you about the teacher toolkit that we created, and this has the wrong URL. I'm so sorry. Um, it's resources.primarysource.org slash queen of water. Um, and it has discussion questions, book and film recommendations, websites, um, activities, a vocabulary list. And there are three taped interviews that Laura did with Maria, um, which might also answer some of your questions about um, you know, how Maria feels about the book being published and, and how she, um, some issues around the issue of domestic, of, of indigenous populations today. Um, and coming up at Primary Source, we have um, a webinar on December 11th on the role of storytelling in African culture um, with a teacher from Uganda. We also have three online courses beginning in um, January and March. And you can find more details on our website, primarysource.org slash online courses. And we do encourage you to stay in touch with us um, through Facebook, through Twitter. Um, you can find uh, information on our homepage as well as um, you know, on any of our emails. We'll be following up with you with an email with some of these links that we mentioned today. We will also have the recording of this webinar available. So if you came in late or had to leave early or have missed any of it or just want to listen to it again, um, we will have that available on our YouTube channel. So. Thank you all again so much um, for your participation. And thank you, Laura, for taking this time to answer all of our questions and talk about the Queen of Water with us. Um, I, I think um, everyone would probably say that this has been a very inspiring hour um, to think about this book and talk about it. Well, so thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. This was really an honor for me. And, and I so appreciate you all reading my book and hope that you continue to have interesting discussions about it. And thank you again, Jennifer, for all your work. Sure. Thanks so much, Laura.